Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's MDICX webinar. My name is Liliana Rincon Gonzalez. I'm the program director for clinical sciences and for the EFS initiative here at MDIC. It is my pleasure to host this webinar on EFS site best practices, lessons learned from sites achieving 60, 60, 60. We are very excited because this is our first webinar on EFS best practices. And for this special occasion, we have invited two representatives from different clinical sites to tell us about their experiences setting up for EFS and to share best practices and lessons learned. In addition, we have invited the chair of the EFS initiative to share an overview of the work we do here at MDIC and the progress we have done on this initiative. And we're gonna go over the agenda. First, I will have each of my panelists introduce themselves. Then we will listen to each of the presentations and then we will open the webinar for questions. Please use the Q&A or chat boxes on your screen to type your questions. I will then read each of the questions so the panelists can answer them. Finally, I just want to let everyone know that the recording and slides will be available on our website and, the and for the people who register for the webinar will get an email with the link in the next week or so. Okay, so we will start with Chip Hans our MDIC board champion for the EFS initiative. Chip. Hey, thank you, uh, Liliana, and a real pleasure uh, to be here on what I think will be a very exciting uh, discussion. Uh, just uh, by way of introduction for this topic, uh, I'm a 30-year veteran of the medical device industry, uh, but uh, back in 2012, uh, 2013, I was an entrepreneur in residence at CDRH, uh, working with a team that uh, worked on trying to streamline the IDE approval process. And back when uh, early feasibility study uh, guidance was just uh, initiated. And before that, uh, I led uh, the Abbott Vascular Interventional Cardi uh, Cardiology Division for uh, just about 10 years uh, and was involved with many, many uh, uh, clinical studies, uh, both in the U.S. and outside the U.S. Uh, let me turn it over to uh, Nicole to introduce herself. Um, so, hello, I'm Nicole. I'm a clinical research supervisor here at the Heart Hospital Plano through the Baylor Scott and White Research Institute. Um, I've been a nurse for 17 years. Uh, the majority of my nursing was spent in the cardiovascular intensive care unit. All of my nursing experience is actually CV, and I've been here in research for three years. And we'll go to Beth. Hi, everyone. My name is Beth Wilson. Um, I am our clinical research manager for the Cardiovascular Institute at OHSU in Portland. Um, I've been in clinical research for 10 years now, um, started out as a research assistant and have been in my current role for the last four years. Um, we are a newer site to the EFS world, um, and I'm excited to be able to share some of our experiences with you all. Thank you, Beth. And now we'll turn it to Chip for the presentation. Great. Well, uh, let's get started, and uh, I will uh, be brief because I know we really want to hear from Nicole and uh, Beth. Uh, but just for uh, those of you who are not uh, familiar with the uh, Medical Device Innovation Consortium, or MDIC, uh, we are a uh, 5013C public-private partnership uh, created with the sole objective of advancing regulatory science of medical devices for the benefit of uh, patients. And it's a very unique partnership uh, that involves industry, uh, nonprofits, and uh, FDA, CMS, and NIH all as members. And this is the area where we can collaborate together to uh, you know, solve uh, uh, complex uh, regulatory science uh, questions. And the methodology that we uh, use is uh, just as you're experiencing right now. We, we create a forum for collaboration of multiple stakeholders, quite typically uh, industry, uh, FDA, uh, in this instance, uh, clinical sites coming together uh, to I identify challenging issues where we might be able to uh, develop tools and methodologies to uh, drive uh, innovation. And then MDIC uh, essentially coordinates those uh, activities. Uh, 
Uh, we're bringing our attention to early feasibility studies. We've been working on this area for the last uh, four or five uh, years, and it's uh, very relevant uh, because these are uh, studies designed to gain early insights into innovative medical technologies during the development process before starting a large uh, clinical trial. Uh, and the benefits of uh, these early feasibility studies are very apparent to um, all the stakeholders that uh, participate in those, whether they be uh, patients, FDA, sites, uh, or, or the sponsors of the studies themselves. And I think because of these uh, clear benefits, this uh, program has experienced a lot of uh, growth over the last uh, five years. So uh, in 2013 is when the guidance uh, for early feasibility studies was first uh, made available. And then this is actually FDA data of the uh, number of submissions in blue and those studies that FDA actually approved by uh, fiscal year um, over the last five years. And you can see there's been growing uh, interest and growth in the studies themselves over the last uh, five years. Uh, and I think it's useful to have some perspective. Uh, the FDA approves somewhere around uh, 250 IDEs in a given year. So we're now seeing something like 20% or so on average of the IDEs being these early feasibility studies, which I think is uh, uh, clear that there was an unmet need for these kinds of studies in the US and great interest going forward. So um, we are trying uh, at MDIC with multiple stakeholders to develop a site network uh, for early feasibility studies that would essentially be a national early feasibility study learning system. And uh, to be able to uh, learn as a complex uh, ecosystem, you need to track uh, your performance via metrics. You have to develop uh, tools and you have to share uh, experiences of what works, what doesn't work, so that all uh, parties in the, the um, uh, in the nation get a chance to uh, benefit from that and this uh, event here today is a classic of uh, how we can share our best practices. So um, we've now uh, got uh, in our EFS uh, site network pilot um, some expectations of both sites and sponsors. They commit to uh, per pursue our target early feasibility um, uh, performance metrics. They commit to trying to use, make use of the tools that we develop and uh, give us feedback on what's working and what's not um, within their respective uh, institutions or within their respective companies. They seek to identify the barriers and what might make it uh, more streamlined. And then uh, of course, uh, sponsors retain the responsibility uh, for site selection but we uh, think by having a network of interested parties who are focused on learning, they might be uh, preferred uh, players uh, for consideration of uh, other early feasibility studies. So the site network has grown uh, quite a bit. Uh, it uh, was established by invitation and uh, as you can see, uh, many leading institutions uh, spread across the United States are active members and committed to uh, this initiative. And likewise, we have a number of uh, supporting uh, partners, uh, both uh, large companies, small companies, uh, FDA and CMS, all coming together to try and establish a uh, learning network on this uh, particular initiative. Um, what's especially relevant today is uh, what we term the 60-60-60 goal. And this came out of work uh, two years ago that MDIC did where we were actually able to consolidate a number of early feasibility studies and were able to obtain uh, confidentially the uh, data on how long it took for each site to actually get through an IRB approval process, how much time was spent going back and forth between uh, sponsors and uh, sites on contract reviews. And once the IRB and contract uh, approvals were obtained, how much longer it took to obtain the first subject enrollment uh, for each of the uh, 
uh, sites within the uh, uh, given data set. And this is, uh, I believe, uh, 40 to 50 different uh, site experiences uh, consolidated. But what you can see is the FDA review process, as measured by sponsors, has become quite short. That's the bar in the green. Um, it's uh, on average 68 days to obtain an IDE approval for an early feasibility study in this particular data set that we had, um, which included a lot of cardiovascular studies. Um, the IRB approval, we would uh, term in yellow uh, on average 72 days versus the 60 days uh, that's involved. And then, of course, this is in parallel to the contract uh, review process, which was uh, on average taking 133 days, think of it as five months, uh, to negotiate a contract before the actual screening of patients and initiating a study can actually occur. And then once that uh, contract and IRB approval occurred, the first subject to roll was another 187 days. So this whole process, just about a year on average. And uh, this is probably one of the single biggest barriers to uh, additional early feasibility studies coming to the U.S. because of the time uh, that it takes to uh, get patients actually enrolled and being part of it in what is largely administrative activities, not really related to uh, the process themselves. So um, anyway, uh, we've been focused on this activity uh, when we first got into this, one of the ideas was could we simplify the clinical trial um, uh, 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 negotiation process by developing a pre-agreed master clinical uh, trial agreement. And we were able to bring eight sponsors and maybe a, a 10 sites together to actually negotiate a master clinical trial agreement that is posted on the uh, MDIC website at the link uh, uh, listed below, um, and we're actually updating that activity uh, um, uh, this uh, next month, I guess it is. We've also developed a patient informed consent form template that might streamline that process, and there are other tools for educating IRBs, research staff, and potential patients on what early feasibility studies are all about. So uh, last slide is uh, what are our plans for 2019? We will continue with our uh, uh, communications, and uh, we have run two workshops uh, to date, uh, EFS Site Best Practices, and these presentations that follow were some of the best from that particular event in uh, um, uh, Virginia uh, in March. And just last week, we had a, a TVT symposium on uh, best practices for patient screening and enrollment, and so Watch Your Mailbox will be getting uh, future webinars out from the best presentations from that particular uh, meeting. We have the contracting rep webinar that I just spoke of that's on July 9th, and then we have um, uh, an IRB informed consent workshop at uh, Baylor in Texas in October. Uh, there are other activities, and if you're interested, please reach out to uh, Liliana. Uh, we'd love to have uh, everyone's involvement in this learning system. Uh, so with that, um, the, the uh, final slide on questions uh, uh, has Liliana's um, information, and we'll have that uh, later uh, in the slides. But let me turn it over to Nicole so we can get started. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. So I've been tasked with discussing uh, best practices here at our site at the Heart Hospital in Plano. Um, first slide, please. Uh, what are best practices? Uh, first, there are a set of guidelines, ethics, or ideas that represent the most efficient or prudent course of action, a procedure that has been shown by research and experience to produce optimal results, and they serve as a general framework or standard for a variety of situations. So I like to think of it as a, as a checklist, a flow for you guys to follow. Um, achieving 60-60-60. To achieve 60-60-60, it takes multiple parts working together at the same time. So here at our site, we have three things going on uh, concurrently with each other. The project manager is working, the regulatory specialist is working, and then we have our clinical coordinator. So we're doing budget, contract, getting submissions ready for the IRB. We're focusing on uh, when we're going to have the SIV, making sure physicians are present, and getting all the training records, financial disclosures, and everything completed. So within that 60, we can screen and enroll our first patient. 
Um, we use a system called Smart Sheets that helps keep us up with our timelines that help us achieve that also. Uh, next slide. Amendments. So new things are learned on a daily basis with EFS trials and it can lead to multiple amendments to the protocol. Uh, we've established a specific timeline where the regulatory specialist sets a deadline for herself and the clinical research coordinator based on the next IRB board review. And the CRC a submission to the sponsor of the required training records for the amendment will coincide with the submission of the amendment with the IRB by the regulatory specialist. This way we can almost guarantee when we get an approval for this amendment that we will be ready to get the green light also from the sponsor at the same time. A specific language has been created for applications. For example, if the sponsor has asked for more, asked the FDA for more uh, subjects to be enrolled, we have specific language that we put in our original application that allows that amendment to go through an expedited review with our IRB. Next. Um, enrollment, how do you find the subjects? So here at the Heart Hospital, we're lucky. We have a very specific clinics for service lines. Uh, for example, we have a TAVR clinic every Thursday, mitral and tricuspid clinics are every Tuesday, and we have an aortic clinic every Monday. Within each clinic, we take a heart team approach. So we will have an interventional cardiologist, a surgeon, be it cardiovascular or vascular, depending on the clinic. We have a heart failure specialist, Research is actually present running these clinics, running what we like to call the war room, where we review each subject and we find the best, um, best research trial for the patient. Um, all, all the basic required testing for screening is completed. Uh, protocol specific testing is scheduled before the subject leaves the clinic. What we like to do is we live in a world where we believe that there should be a trial for every subject that walks through the door. So every patient that comes into clinic, the first thing we do after we review the patient is what trial can we put this patient in? And then we'll be able to, because most of our screening testing is completed, we'll have a good idea about I and E and we're able to go in and talk to that patient about the trial in real time and get them consented before they leave the clinic. Next. Um, physician outreach. We have physicians that travel to different clinics to educate referring physicians about trials and how they can help us to enroll subjects. Uh, we provide education to the referring. Uh, one of our um, structural heart fellows has created a worksheet uh, that lists the required GDMT. So a lot of these EFS trials, before you can put a patient in trial, they have to have been on the proper GDMT for about 30 days. And so we've created a worksheet that we keep with on the patient's chart with each visit to make sure that we're on those right doses of those medications, whether they're able to take them or they were not able to take them. This is communicated with the referring physician so they too can see where the patient is uh, with treatment. We also are working on creating a folder where we are providing referring with a pamphlet on each trial with the basic I and E. So when they're seeing these patients in their clinics before they refer them to us, they can have an idea of what we need or what you, know, what you can't the inclusion exclusion before they refer them to our clinic. Uh, specific procedure dates. Before our patients leave their clinic visit, they are provided a day that their procedure will take place that gives us a timeline uh, to set for submissions for screening. Um, these days generally do not change. So we have, for example, TAVR is every Wednesday and Friday and two Mondays a month. The mitral and tricuspid procedures are every first, third, and fifth Monday. Next. Collaboration. We have a device startup committee uh, we originally met two times a month and have reduced it to once a month, and this has created less confusion surrounding devices and decreased emails. Uh, the meeting includes our finance from the hospital, directors from the supply chain, the cath lab, the OR, and research leadership. We discuss new trials, device cost, other supplies that will be required for the trial. Um, I have to say this has been, being in research in three, for three years, this has been the best collaboration that I've seen because it actually is bringing research really into the hospital setting so everyone can see what we're doing and it's a good way to keep a communication with the hospital, especially when it comes to cost. Um, Cath Lab, EP, OR our staff are present at our site initiation visits and our device training. They can bring a lot of things to the table. They understand the flow of the procedures, which is very helpful for us in research. And sometimes they'll have ideas. Maybe you might use this device, you might need this, and they'll be able to talk to the sponsors. Uh, we have provided training. Uh, one of the sponsors recently came out and provided training for our ECHO and CT imaging staff for specific protocol requirements. Next. 
Uh, best practice at a department level. We have weekly huddles, which is just our research department staff only. And in each weekly huddle, um, we set our expectations, what we expect, what the sponsors expect. These are things like we want data in within three to five days, queries need to, uh, and monitor action need to be answered within five to 10 business days. We also take a specific point of time in those meetings to talk about study enrollment. Um, enrollment numbers are discussed with each service line and it's a great way for us as a department to talk about enrollment struggle, pardon me, struggles for the group and also to discuss successes. Uh, we also have weekly research meetings um, every Thursday morning. These research meetings are broken up per service line and it's a great way for our physicians to get involved. They're present, all the PIs are present. We're able to talk enrollment numbers. So like you can see, one service line is discussed each week. We talk about individual site screening, enrollment numbers. We review in comparison to total enrollment numbers. So our PIs like to see what we're doing compared to what the uh, sponsor's expecting us to do. Uh, PIs and research staff are always present at this meeting and we are always collaborating and coming up with new ideas. Next step. Best practice in process. So as we've been going through these EFS trials, uh, we see things that we always can improve on. The first thing is a screening consent. When you have multiple EFS trials that revolve around one or two specific disease process, um, sometimes you'll go to screen that patient and they'll screen fell out, but you've recognized that, oh my gosh, they would be a great candidate for this trial. Unfortunately, maybe they live four hours away and it's very difficult for those patients to come back and forth. So we're working on a screening consent that would give us a universal way to kind of screen for more than one trial at the same time. And if they are a specific candidate for a certain trial, we're able to bring them in and do that consenting process. And it, it can help limit the visits that they have to come back for. Um, schedule of events. Oh, please say that again. Schedule of events for the uh, patients. So we're working on creating a timeline, kind of like a worksheet to give the patients for things to, you know, we have, you need to get your CT scan. Maybe we need a TEE. Okay, once for this is when we're going to present you to the sponsor. And then once they're approved, give them a timeline. This is what your 30 day visit is going to consist of. And, and that way they feel really involved. You know, our phone numbers are given to them. That way they can be involved and they have expectations kind of set for themselves too. And we are also uh, multiple new physicians coming in. You know, trials require anesthesiologists or different physicians to do things and maybe they're not involved with research. So we're creating a city training kind of flow process for new physicians. Next. Because I like a good sports quote. Uh, practice does not make perfect, only perfect practice makes perfect. And in this case, best practice. Uh, patients deserve a choice when it comes to being treated. Establishing best practices at your site for early feasibility or any trial provides the sponsor and the site the opportunity to be a part of changing medicine. And that's what I have. So Beth. Thanks so much, Nicole. Um, so I am going to kind of walk through our experience with um, our introduction to EFS studies and what we learned um, through a study that ended up being a failure and how we got to um, a study that was a success. Um, so to give you a little background uh, as to who we are, uh, so our team is made up of 21 clinical research staff. Um, at uh, mainly uh, study coordinators um, on the ground um, executing the trials. We also have some administrative support with me as the operations manager, a dedicated finance manager, um, and a regulatory startup specialist. Uh, we have about 100 trials right now currently housed within our team, um, and about 50 of those are actively enrolling. Um, so to kind of set the scene here, our approval process in 2016 um, looked like this. Uh, we had a target deadline of 15 days from rake packet receipt to submission. Um, and our uh, OHSU review process is set up to where after the PI submits, the IRB contract and budget negotiation all happen at the same time. Uh, with the intent that those will finish up within 60 days, giving us a total timeline of 75 days. Um, when we were first approached uh, with our first EFS trial um, in 2016, we had our timeline of 75 days, uh, knew we needed to shave a little bit of time off and thought we were ready to go. Uh, this study, we have now coined the 280-day uh, study because of the timeline that it took. 
Um, and we clearly recognized quickly that uh, OHSU was not quite ready to take this on. Um, so here's a copy of our process and our target goals. Uh, what we learned once our PI submitted the study is that there were all of these other processes that we had no idea that we really needed to streamline for an EFS trial in order to be successful. Um, we had trouble negotiating subject injury and liability language in our contract and our consent form, which led to a 50 day from reg packet receipt to submission timeline. Um, and then with the steady reviews, we made it to 130 days when the sponsor finally pulled the plug on us. Uh, so what we learned from this experience, um, our institution was not built to truly support device trials. Uh, we had had several go through the process before, um, but nothing as complex as an EFS, and we recognized quickly that we needed some new approval processes to make sure that these studies would make it through that process quickly. Um, we still needed to verify who our stakeholders were at the university. We had a good idea of who we should be contacting, but there was no real um, designated person in each area that we should contact um, for the approvals we needed. Um, and lastly, OHSU really needed a driver to push these processes forward. Um, that's when the Cardiovascular Institute stepped up to the plate and we did what we could to put some better processes into place. Uh, the first thing that we tried to tackle was the concept of active engagement. So instead of sending something out to another entity, whether that be another department within the institution um, or the, the trial sponsor, we wanted to make sure that we set clear expectations with turnaround times for those people. And if we didn't hear back them, from them in a certain time frame, we would be following up and asking where are we at in the process, what can we do to continue to push this forward. We also created weekly PI meetings and set as check-ins on these trials. Uh, this gave us an opportunity to engage our PIs and ask for their support in helping push things forward. Um, and lastly, we really asked our PIs and tasked them with the um, responsibility of developing those sponsor relationships. Uh, we found that uh, creating partnerships with our sponsors instead of treating this as a us against them relationship um, was going to go much further in getting these through the process. Uh, one of the unique things that we were able to develop whoops, um, was a startup timeline reporting system. Um, this was a way to prospectively take a look at uh, where a study was at in a given process and quickly see who was the responsible party. Um, this allowed us to, to easily identify who we needed to follow up with and we could see very clearly uh, when the timeline was taking too long. Uh, we also developed a device uh, committee. Uh, this helped us identify our institution's stakeholders and, and really get them committed to this process. Uh, it also allowed us to create cross coverage to eliminate those artificial bottlenecks that come from only having one person at the university able to approve something. Um, we developed through the committee, we developed some efficient processes um, that helped us get through these internal approvals quickly. And then it, we also were able to allocate master contract support for our device sponsors. Uh, we found that this was going to be key in getting through the 60 day timeline. Um, so in 2018, we were uh, contacted by a new sponsor with a, a new EFS trial and we decided to put our uh, learnings to practice and see if we can make it through. Uh, what we found with the things that we had put in place, we were able to uh, shrink our regulatory timelines from that 280 days uh, to 48 days, and our contract was negotiated, negotiated within 55 days. Um, so through this process, some of the, the big uh, highlights that we learned was to identify your key stakeholders involved in your approval processes at your institution and engage them. Make sure that they're invested in this trial just as much as you, your study team, and your PI is. Uh, approach a relationship with the sponsor as a partnership. Um, they want to get this through the approval process just as quickly as you do, and we're here to accomplish the same goal, so let's work together. Um, do your best to uh, establish master contracts with as many trial sponsors as you can. 
um, this is really key to making sure that those contracts don't get hung up on a couple of words um, or a few sentences of language that will take your timeline quickly from you know the 50 day time mark uh, you know all the way up to 130 plus days um, and last but not least that concept of active facilitation through your approval process uh, you really need as a study team to um, support making sure that each step happens in a timely fashion and that someone isn't sitting idle waiting for someone else to do the next step. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beth and Nicole and Chip. That was great. And we'll open the webinar for questions. And again, uh, submit your questions through the Q&A box or the chat box and I'll be able to see them and read them out loud. But while we wait, I have one question that I have been asked before, and that is, how do you know your site is ready for EFS? And I will ask this both to Nicole and Beth. Um, I'll go first. I, when I hear that question, it's not, I think, when I think of it, it's not just so much is your research department ready for that? Is, is, are, is your site ready for that? Is your hospital ready for that? Right. If, you're, if a trial is going to be brought in there, you need to make sure you have a set of physicians that are skilled to do the procedure, um, number one. And then when that takes place, then there's an opportunity um, for your research department. So I would think that you would have to make sure that you're as close as you can get right now with your, your other, trial, other trials as close to 60, 60, 60, um, because it is such a unique patient population. It can take longer to find these patients or worse, you're you have that perfect opportunity, that perfect patient, and you're still 30 days from getting approved. And it might be too late to treat the patient by that time. So uh, making sure you're as close to the 60, 60, 60 as possible, or you're consistently you know, doing a consistent days, amount of days for each trial approval. And then also to make sure that you have the right physician population um, to do the procedure. Okay, thank you. I'm Beth. I, I definitely echo what Nicole said, um, you know, to, to tag along to making sure that you have the, the right physicians, um, making sure that all of the physicians on the team are on the same page. Uh, we, we too have a multidisciplinary team that meets weekly to evaluate patient cases um, and our research team is present and actively engaged in those conversations and I think that, you know, has gone you know, a, a tremendous amount of way to make sure that we're able to enroll patients quickly and meet that 60 day enrollment target. Um, you know, along with the idea of making sure that your hospital administration is on board with participating in this trial because they do have such a large role with device clinical research. Um, they have to be invested and, and there to support um, the trial being successful. Right. Thank you. I ha we do have some questions. Um, I'll start with the first one. Um, can you provide an example or two about how you engage the stakeholders? Maybe these are the stakeholders related to the, the whole process. So. Be it the physicians yeah. and the hospital and everyone? I think so, yeah. I think one way to get them maybe engaged and excited is to use, for example, maybe there was a publication recently from another trial that your department ran and maybe you were the top enrollers and you kind of, you know, if, if the stakeholders be other physicians or the hospital or see um, what kind of spotlight it brought to your site, it might engage them in a way, in, in that way. There's an example of engaging them, trying to see what the work you do, how it gets out there, and how it's seen um, to help engage them. Uh, patient, I, I know for our site, especially uh, a patient having a great experience and wanting to talk about that experience holds a lot to our uh, leaders in the hospital setting, so that helps also. I think, you bring, I think, um, go ahead. Sorry. I think for us at OHSU, uh, clinical research is definitely present, but it's not fully understood by a lot of administration outside of the research community. And so I think it's really bringing transparency to what the potential is 
of having EFS or device trials period at your site um, and letting them know, you know, the potential opportunity that exists and really getting their buy-in through that. Okay, and I think related to that, there's a question, how will a sponsor learn about the capabilities, so different therapeutic areas that a site can tackle? I guess, how do you make yourself known to a sponsor? So you, well, one way is from other sponsors, uh, or maybe there's other trials we ran for that specific sponsor. Um, you know, on the sponsor side, I feel like they'd have to get to, they, they might have to network a little bit and talk. If they have something new coming out and they hear, you know, about a group of physicians and they want to get their device into a specific area, or they, you know, heard about a research department, I think it takes a lot of networking, um, or we may have previously ran a trial for them and they bring this trial to us and we tell them if we can or cannot do it. Mm -hmm. I think it's really establishing those metrics ahead of time and you know finding ways to access your, your patient population that you have to tap into early. Um, that way, you know, you know, sponsors are understanding if you don't have the patient population and, you know, they're not going to hold it against you if you can't participate. Um, but what they hate to see is you attempting to participate and then finding out after the fact that you don't actually have the patients to enroll. Right. And I have a few questions for MDIC. Uh, I think there's a confusion with the annual public forum, and yes, that's on the 5th and that's on a Thursday. Sorry for the confusion. Um, there's a question about the 60-60-60. Someone is asking, does 60-60-60 refer to sequential activities or can these activities be concurrent? And the idea is that the first two activities, so IRB approval and contract approval, we want those to be parallel, so that's within the first 60 days, and then first subject enrollment in the next 60 days. Uh, the next question I have, um, are there any suggestions for how to uh, speed up the contracting process? Well, this is Chip. I'll, I'll uh, maybe start with uh, that one because we've had some comments uh, about it, but uh, also let me say thanks to our, uh, our panelists. I thought you guys did a terrific job, and it's evident so much work went into achieving what you've uh, uh, simplified in your presentation. Um, in terms of simplifying the contracting process, what I have heard consistently from um, uh, all sites is that for, those, for uh, large sponsors, when you can achieve a master agreement and put those in place, that saves an enormous amount of time uh, as individual studies uh, come up. And so I've, I've come across a number of sites who uh, have four, five, six, seven, eight master clinical trial agreements that get established over uh, two or three years. Um, the other thing that I hear pretty consistently from uh, sites is that uh, if you let the process devolve into a uh, email uh, conversation between um, attorneys it inevitably goes slower and uh, what happens is uh, people will get a, uh, a contract sent over, um, a review will occur and then three four weeks later a response will go back and then they look at red lines and then they go back and forth and back and forth and that what, that's what makes this a five, six, ten, twelve month um, process simply because uh, 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 facilitation to get people on the phone uh, and, and work through issues and get it done. And I think it's um, internally to a site, if you can go to your uh, attorney and say, we will save you a lot of time if we can just get this, all these issues addressed at once and get a phone conversation, it's amazing how quickly it gets uh, resolved and in a timely uh, fashion. So, um, you know, Beth or Nicole, you would want a, a comment as well. Yeah, Chip, I, you know, I echo what you mentioned. The master contracts have been key for our site and our success, um, as well as um, getting the lawyers to talk to each other on the phone and hopefully having either the PI or someone from the city team there to help, you know, interpret the ins and outs of the protocol um, and apply it to that contract. 
this is Chip again. I probably should have mentioned this master clinical trial agreement. The purpose of that was a lot of the uh, um, back and forth is around things like indemnification, insurance, and so what we tried to uh, arrive at in that particular uh, meeting was compromise language that both sponsors and sites could uh, commonly agree to and make that a starting point for uh, negotiations to hopefully uh, streamline the process of uh, attorneys taking uh, the most uh, 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 strongest differentiating position uh, to defend their respective turf and get to middle ground compromise uh, more quickly. Okay, should we continue with questions? Uh, there's one from the site perspective, what can a sponsor do to aid the site on the 60-60-60? And this person is referring to one of the slides had a, a long bar for sponsor. I think this was one of your slides, Beth. Yeah, so, you know, I think just as much as we push on our end as a site to make sure that things make it through our internal processes quickly, you know, the sponsors have many layers are on their end um, and, and reviews can get hung up for quite some time making it through the different people it needs to go to on their end. So I think, you know, part of it is the sponsor and their communication, but us helping them to facilitate that communication um, and having the PI develop those relationships with leadership at the sponsor um, to where if, you know, there is a hang up with the person on the ground helping, you know, get the consent form finalized or whatnot, then we can escalate quickly to someone who can take action um, and help us get over that hurdle. Uh, so I think I, I can't speak from the sponsor perspective, but, you know, in helping the, the sponsor uh, review documents quickly. I think it's making sure that us as a site has the right contact information um, and we're keeping track of how long something has been with a sponsor. Hmm. You know, also what, one thing that we've uh, started to implement with um, that timeline bar graph that I showed everyone um, was once we finish a trial, we like to send that completed bar graph to the sponsor and have kind of a debrief of how the process went, where the hangups were, and really point out to the sponsor, you know, yes, the study may have taken 90 days, but here's from our perspective, the, the contribution that you had on your end to that timeline. And that really opens up the conversation to make it more of a collaboration um, when you draw out and highlight where things were stuck in, in along the process. That's a great idea. Yeah, that sounds like a great process because you're also giving feedback to the sponsor on what they can improve. Definitely. And there's a few questions about screening and the consent process. The first one is for the screening consent process, where is screening for multiple potential studies at once? Who covers that expense? Are all IRBs on board with this? So our IRB is actually reviewing this consent now. Um, so this initial screening consent, you know, a lot of EFS trials have specific testing that have to be done that's paid for by the sponsor. Therefore, you have to have sign, you know, that consent form for that trial. What we were thinking of is, you know, sometimes these trials, uh, they want that, you know, we, we can give them that first echo. They want to see this first echo before they move forward, that, that whole screening to screen patient type situation. And is there a way for us to multiple do multiple screenings for these patients to find the best trial for them versus, oh, we think they're a good, a good fit for this one. Oh, they screen failed and now we have no other opportunities for them and we've missed a research patient entirely. Um, so this is a, it's a work in process for us with the screening consent. And the idea is to have a pre-screening a general consent. Yes, it's like a pre-screening. Yes, exactly. Yes, it's a pre. Thinking more of it like a pre-screening type situation. And do you have any issue bringing it up with the IRB, like proposing that to the IRB? We really, no, we haven't. And so, um, you know, there's specific language we have to use for our IRB for our consent. And so we took had an example from another site 
and was able to collaborate with them and use some of their wording in with our wording. And so then what we did is we sent it out to sponsors for them to review, to get oh. in on the process to see if they approve of this. Because what will happen is, is if, if a sponsor doesn't approve of this, well, then we won't use it for their trial. Um, but if a sponsor right. does, then what we do is we'll send it back to the IRB and we will submit that screening consent for those each individual trials um, as, as a consent form that we can use for pre-screening. Okay. And there's a few other questions, unless anyone wants to say anything else, I'll, I'll continue reading questions. Uh, well, I just, this is Chip. I just wanted yep. to comment on the screening process because yep. we, we do know of one site that's taken that all the way through and is routinely uh, using this. And uh, the same question about who pays for the screen came up um, in our uh, workshop uh, last week. Uh, so, so far, they found that it was fairly obvious uh, in uh, where that should go, but uh, it has come up that. Uh, uh, it may not be in all instances so obvious uh, who should be the one who pays for the actual uh, screening activity. So I think that's going to probably evolve as this kind of approach uh, happens and uh, uh, the mechanics become more obvious. And it may be something we end up, you know, budgeting for in negotiations in the future. But I, but I also think that in, you, what you just described, uh, Nicole, is what I think a lot of people are experiencing is that, uh, you know, everyone sees how obvious it is that it could streamline activity and right. uh, it's just sort of getting alignment on a slightly different process and yeah. whether it be the IRBs or the sponsors, they're all uh, they're pretty aligned that this is something that uh, makes sense if you're doing multiple studies, then why not take advantage of a streamlined yeah, process? Yeah, exactly. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question here about what is your experience with non-significant risk? EFS of non-surgical drug-free medical devices where the number of subjects is less than 15, the number of sessions per subject is one, and the session lasts two hours or less. Do any of you have any experience with that? No. I, we have in, in a limited fashion, um, I guess, I guess maybe I would like a little more clarification as to you know what you're looking for as far as feedback goes with that um i mean it, i think it comes down to your screening processes to identify the the patients who you know you can catch before having a procedure or um who are coming in for another appointment uh, especially with those non-significant risks you can um tag on to an appointment that already exists. That way you're not asking the patient to come back for something, you know, more minimal and, and non-interventional. Um, I think that would be one of the, the ways that we've been successful in enrolling quickly to those trials. I think if you can uh, create a patient list and really enroll to those quickly um, and get them open and closed, I think that's the best approach. Well, this is Chip. I would say the uh, most of the work in this early feasibility study initiative has been focused on, you know, uh, PMA type uh, um, uh, significant risk uh, devices. But uh, I, I do know the FDA is very interested in encouraging, and most of it's cardiovascular, uh, been very interested in encouraging, um, you know, other therapeutic areas who are interested in this type of clinical research to uh, band together and uh, work for uh, streamlined um, uh, you know, feasibility style uh, research to be uh, easier to be conducted in the U.S. So if the questioner has a specific area, I'd suggest you email Liliana. I, I mean, I know for a fact that the FDA is encouraged, is interested in encouraging other therapeutic areas to, to follow a similar model and that may be one of the activities MDIC tries to tackle in 2020. 
Okay. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to contact me and I'll try to answer the questions or put in contact with someone who can. And there's one more question here. It says, is there any value to a similar harmonization of IRBs and RCAs for with respective studies, so low risk uh, studies that do not require IDEs, especially in imaging and studies to evaluate AI and machine learning? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I don't think we have an obvious answer. To that one. <laughs> I agree, uh, but that's a great, a great idea. I think it'd probably would be interesting to get more context, uh, context for that. So uh, again, I would suggest uh, follow up with you, Liliana. It might make sense. Yep. And I think we don't have any more questions from the audience, but I do have a question for Beth, and she mentioned the device committee. And I was just curious to know who is in this committee. Yeah, um, so we have our cardiovascular um, hospital service line director. Uh, we have our purchasing uh, manager and um, a couple of the, the people responsible for purchasing. We have our uh, hospital finance team there. Um, we have our central contracting team, as well as our clinical research billing office present. Um, and then we have uh, several PI representatives from not only the, the cardiovascular space, but also um, from neurology and ortho as well um, to try to develop best practices for all of our device studies. And this is not only for EFS, correct? This is general. Correct. The, okay. Correct. That's great. And this is in addition to the, I think the committee you mentioned at the beginning. Mm -hmm. okay. It's important to have, I think, a device startup committee, especially if it's something where the sponsor, I mean, where the site, the hospital is going to have to pay for the device in those situations, because uh, that way you get to sit down and talk about what the cost of that is. And if it's going to be, you know, you may get a denial from the hospital saying, no, I'm sorry, we can't participate in that, you know, because of the cost and reimbursement and things. So it's, it's good to include them and they get a better picture mm -hmm. of what we do. Um, so I know ours have been super beneficial to us as a research department. Great. And I have one last question. Uh, I think both of you talked about the 60-60-60 and how you're meeting that, but I was just curious if you were having any travel enrolling that first patient or any patients in a timely manner. No, I think it just depends because sometimes you know, if you're able to have three, let's, let's just say you, if you're able to have um, more than one early feasibility trial for a specific patient population um, and they're all starting about the same time, you know, I think you have a better opportunity to tag one, to get one patient for that. And so um, we kind of go, um, you know, we have our ups and downs. Uh, we have a trial that might might not enroll for three months, and then all of a sudden we have seven patients to screen for that trial. I think it's just hit and miss. And for us, you know, we don't use Epic right now, so we're it's you know we have we can't query run queries. Uh, we really rely solely on we do a lot of footwork. Uh, we're in these patients. We're in these surgeons clinics. We're in these um, heart team clinics. The specific service lines, and we're always always you know we're talking to the doctors. We are getting emails from our navigators inside the hospital, letting us know what patients have been transferred and um, different things like that. So we're lucky in that sense, um, you know, that the INE can be so particular that that in itself makes it difficult at first. Right. So you rely mostly on the service line. Yes, we do. Right. 
I think uh, for us at OHSU, we have a similar situation where we have a very invested um, heart team who, you know, with those weekly meetings, we're reviewing all patients that come through the door and we're really considering every single person for our clinical trial. Um, and like Nicole said, if you have, you know, multiple trials that you can stack and, you know, if a patient doesn't meet this criteria, then they meet the criteria for this other one and really making sure that you have a diverse portfolio that captures a lot of patient situations. Um, there's, you know, also some, um, there's an ability to query ecosystems out there. There's a lot of um, you know, the abilities to, to query databases and develop databases that I think is also a really, really helpful tool with making sure that you're enrolling um, on a consistent basis. Great. Thank you. And maybe just very quick to, uh, for Beth, how did you create the graph that you showed us? Yeah, um, so it's a it's a little bit of a manual process right now. We're working with our stats team to to develop a program that allows us to automatically enter the data. Um, but our regulatory startup specialist uh, that was part of why we developed her role was to help track these metrics. So she's making sure that as information is leaving our hands and going somewhere else, that date is recorded and we're actively taking a look at uh, when the next date should occur. Um, so when she populates those dates in our database, that's what populates that bar graph. Um, it, like I mentioned, it's been really helpful with communicating with sponsors. Um, I know that they have similar tools that they use to track uh, site performance. Um, and so it's really great to be able to have something to track the just overall performance of opening a trial. Right, and it's also a visual tool, which is great. Mm -hmm. it, it, RPIs absolutely love it because they can look at the colors and they know yeah. <laughs> what each color means. Okay, I think we're getting to the top of the hour and unless someone wants to say something, I'll say a few things. I, uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who was able to participate in this today. I think this is really great, and we're very excited to um, be able to contribute our experience, but I know there's a lot of other sites out there probably having the similar struggles that Nicole and I have both experienced. So we would love to network um, and communicate with other sites and what their experiences have been as well. Yeah, no, it was great. It's great to have this platform to share this uh, best practices and lessons learned. And I want to thank you both for sharing that and for showing us what you have done. And thank you, Chip. And I just want to remind everyone the resources that we have available on the MDIC Early Feasibility Studies uh, website. You can subscribe to our EFS Express, that's our newsletter, and you can download the tools and templates. And also you can find the MDICX webinar. So just like this one, there will be archived in there. Um, and I look forward to continuing to engage with all of you as we continue to make progress on the EFS initiative. And have a wonderful day. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.